right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from Northern California from Beth Watson. How are you doing, Beth? Good. How are you today? Excellent, excellent. And Beth Great. is the CEO and founder of Navigating Challenging Dialogue. Uh, and she's coached hundreds of C-suite professionals in Fortune 500s and nonprofit sector to have meaningful, drama-free conversations. And who doesn't want to have drama-free conversations, especially in today's world that seems to be addicted to drama? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what we're going to talk about is mastering feedback. So everything you've never been told about the value of getting and receiving feedback. So um, Beth, let's get, let's get straight into it. So people always say, oh yes, you know, I, I want some insight, yes, oh, give me some feedback or whatever. And either they don't really want it uh, or they then regret asking for it because the other person doesn't know how to give it in a constructive manner. So while we all say we want feedback and we want direction so we don't really <laughs> <laughs> that's what i found um my what my work has shown me and the reason i wrote this book is because after coaching probably about 200 um leaders emerging leaders executives on really tough personnel issues or conflicts that have been created what what I realized is that if they had been willing to give feedback or hear feedback right in the beginning, they wouldn't be in this huge, gigantic entanglement that they're now paying me to help them resolve. And so um, the reason we resist feedback so much, the reason we resist getting it or receiving it is because we have a self-concept. We have a picture of ourselves in our brain and when we hear feedback, it interrupts that image or that picture that we have. And so it's uncomfortable to hear. And you hit the nail on the head. The reason we resist giving it is because it's really uncomfortable when we have thoughts of, oh, it'll make the person unhappy, it'll impact our relationship, all of those types of things. So on both sides, there's a great deal of um, resistance and hesitation around the feedback process. Um, yeah, because let's face it, I mean, part of it is that as you, and which is great why you've written the book like Mastering Feedback, uh, because we're not taught how to do this. I mean, you, you know, as, it's, it's kind of funny, like as you go up through the ranks, maybe, and you become a manager, and then you become a leader or whatever, nobody ever, nobody really ever teaches you any of these things. You're sort of supposed to organically learn them, and some people are naturally good at it, and most of us suck. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth and we are taught one model right we're taught yeah. the feedback sandwich we've all heard about it say something nice say something difficult then get back to something nice really quickly and the reality is the feedback sandwich needs to be thrown out it doesn't work the person who's receiving the feedback already knows that they're queued up for something difficult it's going to be coming and the first thing that you say is really performative or contrived to the good thing, right? You're, you're like, okay, what's a good thing I'm gonna say? Um, and it's a really painful process and nobody gets anything out of it. And so um, the, the reason I got into leadership development and created the Navigating Challenging Dialogue model is because I was one of those people. I got promoted because I was really great at what I did. I ran a sales and marketing team and I was a great performer and contributor when I was a member of the team. So when it was time for a promotion, I got promoted. But I didn't understand that I was going to be supervising this group of humans that there's a lot to learn about how to motivate people, how to empower people, how to get people to use their genius, when to <clears throat> let go and when to put your foot on the brake. And so um, it was trial by fire and there was a lot of difficult learning. And I thought I have got to go on this mission to get into those humanistic soft skill sides of things about what makes people tick and how we can manage uh, really amplifying that. 
No, I, I absolutely, and I and I agree with you about the model um, because most people's experience of getting feedback exactly is that is like, oh yes, you know, Beth, you you do this very well. Um, now let me get on to the fifty things that you don't do well that I really <laughs> want to talk about because that's yes. somewhere human nature is like that, and so we we res we resist that. So as you started your research, um, what did what were some of the surprising things you learned about how people how people receive information? Well, um, let me start with the most surprising thing I learned and then I'll go to how people receive information. Mm -hmm. The most sh shocking thing that I learned was that something like, and I'm not gonna have the numbers completely correct, but something like 70% of people want feedback and an almost equal number of managers and leaders don't give feedback even though people desperately want it. And so my belief is it's because they don't know how. It's because they're afraid to give it. And that's been my concrete experience. How people receive feedback, this is something that's really important. If people leave with only one piece of information today, I want it to be this. The feedback has to be grounded in an experience that's real, and that just happened in a short time frame. Waiting for the six month or annual review, it, performance reviews aren't feedback sessions. Performance reviews are about closing the gap on how you're achieving the goals. And generally they have a monetary um, piece attached to it. That's what performance is about, performance reviews. Mm -hmm. What feedback is about is about, these are where your skills are. These are where your skills need for you to be successful. How are you going to close the gap? What thoughts do you have about closing the gap? And really anchoring it in one piece of information at a time and then pausing and empowering the person to begin to develop the plan of what they're going to do, how they're gonna close the gap. Most of us have that genius in us. We have the strengths, we have the talents, we have the experience and so, we begin to feel empowered as adults, we want empowerment. And there might be some coaching that you do along with that, some mentoring, but all in all, empowering someone to take the next steps as part of the feedback conversation really builds that engagement, that loyalty. It's what keeps people driven to keep doing their work. Yeah, and I think um, what's fascinating about that is uh, personally, I mean, on a, on a personal note, to be honest, I, I I can't stand the the annual review thing. I think it's um, it's a waste of time, mostly, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. Because I think, to be honest, if you're if you're a good manager, you should really be reviewing your people on a daily basis. And then, as you said, um, giving feedback at the point of impact, because you're absolutely correct. It's great when you come up for an annual review and they say, oh, John, remember last February? And I'm like, not really, to be honest. No. No. <laughs> and how do you take action on something that old? Like the, the point when you can take action on it has passed. Yep. And so what happens in traditional performance evaluations is most of the conversation is about arguing about whether or not the person doing the review really has a handle on what's going on. And back bad feelings come out of them. The, the thing that soothes it is hopefully you get the raise, right? And then you're like, yeah. okay, I suffered through that. I get the raise. Now I'll go back to doing what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. And the good part about it is those things that they said to me that I needed to work on, they're never going to check on anyway. So we'll right. go yeah. to yeah. one. Um, so how important, I mean, so how important is it then to learn uh, the right way of setting up the environment for giving feedback, for instance, because if I call you into the office and you sit on the other side of the desk of me, I mean, and I'm going to give you feedback, I've already created an environment, I've already created an environment, right? And I've already said, yes. you know, I'm going to deliver something, you're going to receive it, I'm in a power position, you're not blah, blah, blah. So how important is it that you give consideration to where and how you deliver feedback? Well, what I really advocate for in the book is normalizing the culture around feedback. So it's not a special event. It's not a special occasion where you send out an interview, an invitation and somebody comes and they're hesitant and nervous. It becomes something that happens in your meetings, in your check-ins, in your normal conversation. Hey, John, I have a piece of feedback for you. 
on how you delivered that podcast. I noticed this. This is where we're trying to go. This is the gap. Do you have any thoughts on how you might close that gap? Any actions? What do your what do you see about this? And you have an opportunity to say to me, oh wow, do you have a specific example? Or have you seen something that's worked in the past that might be helpful to me? Or oh, I want to take a day and think about that. Can we talk about can we come back to it tomorrow? But it's not, it's not a, you know, drum roll, here comes the feedback and everybody's waiting for you to, you know, back in the old day when we worked in offices, everybody's waiting for you to come out because they know you went in for a feedback conversation. We get it, we have to normalize it and make it just part of how we check in how we talk about what's going on. The other piece is feedback is not just, it needs to become not just supervisor to employee within that hierarchy. There's um, a model I'm sure you have heard it talked about, the power paradox. And one of the components of that is the higher you get up in the power realm, the less you are willing to listen to feedback, ask for feedback or participate in feedback, you get into this expert mode where you believe you no longer need feedback. So one exercise I do with every leader I work with is ask for three pieces of feedback. One from someone you trust, one from someone you don't trust, maybe you had a conflict with them or they screwed you over in the past, and one from someone you're not sure about and just sit and receive it and notice what it feels like. And then listen for the trends of what you hear. So pick a very specific topic. Don't just say, hey, can you give me some feedback on how I'm doing? That's too general. You get nothing, right, with that. But instead, just go through it and then sit and spend some time reflecting and see if there's some themes and trends in there that you can pull out but predominantly the activity is about getting more comfortable receiving feedback. Yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating. I love that idea of actually um, getting those three people and then receiving the, receiving the feedback. Then what should you be reflecting on when you reflect on it? What, what should be some of the things that you're looking for? So the juice in the feedback is most of the time it's not mm -hmm. the exact words that people say or the exact thing. It's what's underneath it. It's the theme. So someone might say, well, John, I notice you're a little scattered in how you communicate in meetings and you don't stay on topic, right? Mm -hmm. And then the next person might say, yeah, I love reporting to you, but one thing is when you delegate things to me, your communication around it isn't clear necessarily. And then someone else might have another, another piece of feedback along the same lines. So the theme in that is um, it's not necessarily to work on that one thing, but maybe to work on honing your message. How do I get more pinpointed right. in my communication? And so it, so that's what you want to reflect on. The other piece is thinking about how it felt to get the feedback and what the delivery method that person used was. Then read my book or yeah. read my book ahead of it and use the four-step process that's in the book to begin to frame how you deliver feedback, how you set that up and notice what the discrepancy is and how the discrepancy made you feel. Yeah, I no, guarantee 75% of people are going to give you the feedback sandwich. I promise. <laughs> yeah, no, and that, absolutely. And I think that's a great, uh, a great point is like, uh, you know, receive the feedback yourself and then understand how that felt. And obviously I would absolutely encourage you um, read the book uh, before. But the great thing about that is then you have a reference point for when you're delivering feedback, you, you want to go, okay, I don't want to deliver it in that way, or, you know, I want to do it in a way that's far more constructive or far more actionable or whatever it is. But being on the receiving end of it is a great way of, of experiencing it. Yes. And learning, and, learning. And, you know, a lot of your listeners are probably people that maybe don't supervise anyone. They're individual contributors. But I guarantee there are times when they have to deliver feedback to their prospective clients Mm -hmm. to the engineering team, to the delivery team. I know when I was in sales, we were delivery and sales were always um, 
having to give difficult feedback to each other. So, uh, so the application is not just for um, employer, employee, or sub manager, supervisor, whatever. It's also anybody you have to engage with where you have to deliver some feedback. Yeah, or maybe you just, or maybe you need to uh, surreptitiously train your your supervisor in how to give feedback to you. Maybe this is a great opportunity for yes. you to say, "Listen, um, this is how this would really help me," and you know, if you follow this process or whatever. Yes, yes, there's definitely um, some information in there about what to do when you give feedback you don't you don't agree with and how to respond to that. Um, and how to how to deal with those situations. So yeah, yeah, but yeah. Because let's face it. I mean, as we said at the outset, I mean, feedback is great, but we it's very easy for us to get very defensive very quickly, and it's very easy for us to hear what we think we we heard as opposed to what was delivered, and it's very easy to deliver things in a very incoherent way. So it's a kind of perfect storm. Yes. Yes. Yep. A lot of feedback is delivered very emotionally and very quickly because we want to get it over with really fast. Yeah. yeah. And I think part I think part of it though is that uh, we also have to remind ourselves that we're on a journey, right? Because um, it's interesting what you said earlier about the higher you go, the the more you feel yourself as an expert, the less you um, you know want or look for feedback. And I think that's a I think that's a very key and an interesting point because I mean part of it comes from I think when people get into leadership positions is they're afraid of getting feedback because they feel like they should be the expert. Uh, they should be in control. They're so worried about how they're perceived is that it's better to not look for feedback uh, than it is to actually look for feedback. And then, you know, your ego might take a little bit of a bashing. Yes, that is definitely a factor. And we have on our website, we have about 13 um, video series. And one of them is um, about, I can't remember the exact title, but it's about being the expert and how to get more comfortable not being the expert, what you, mm -hmm. what you can do with that, because that trips you up every time you miss important data, important information, people withhold saying to you what the issue is or the challenge, and then you get blindsided by it when it's big and complex. Yeah, and uh, and often that you have the the expert complex, but you also have the imposter complex at the same yes. time. So it's <laughs> it's always great. It's a great combination. On the one hand, you say, "Well, I'm an expert and I know this thing, so I don't really need feedback." And then the other part of you is saying, well, "I'm not really that big an expert at all. I mean, if I look for feedback, I might get found out." Yeah. What if they find out? What if they <laughs> yeah. find out? I don't know. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and but 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 I always found that. Uh, not knowing something or admitting that not that you don't know something about something. I always think that's very trust building in many ways. When somebody says to me, well, I ask them a question and I think they're an expert and they genuinely say to me, you know, that's interesting. I have no idea. I don't know the answer to that. That makes me trust them more, not less. Yes, it's the it's the vulnerability piece, right? And and it shows that people are, are honest. They're yeah. honest and willing to engage from that place, 100%. Yeah. And obviously, just the last uh, the last thing here, obviously, the, just touching on trust. I mean, a lot of this is a, is trust building right? uh, to be able to be able to give regular feedback in a proper way. And for people to want that regular feedback, you have to build that trust between them. Yes. Trust is built one conversation at a time and one experience at a time. And so if you want to continue to build trust with your team or the people around you, the way to approach it is by having these difficult conversations, stepping into them, but making sure that first you're doing your own emotional check-in. What energy am I bringing? What emotions am I bringing? What are my unex unspoken expectations? What values or shoulds am I bringing to this that might not be shared with the other person? And so that's where the tool of curiosity is so important to understand where you have alignment and where you don't. It's a fabulous way. It's also curiosity is the gateway to empathy, which is one of the big topics right now for leaders, right? How are you deploying empathy? And so, um, so curiosity leads you to all of those. 
Yeah. No, we could have a whole conversation yes. on empathy as well. We but, sure could. Uh, <laughs> we could. Maybe, maybe we'll do that in another one. Uh, yes. But listen, this was fantastic. The book is called Mastering Feedback, Everything You've Never Been Told About How to Give Feedback. I would highly, highly recommend that you check it out. The links to the book will be below this video as with all the information about Beth. But before we go, Beth, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. So I am um, a executive coach and a leadership consultant. I also do a lot of skills training around navigating challenging dialogue. And I help organizations to really shift. My mission is to, to shift the way we communicate and reduce the drama and chaos that's completely unnecessary and not needed. And so that is, that's my passion and my mission and the work that I do. Fantastic. A noble mission, reducing drama. I think that is a very noble mission and, uh, and, and getting people communicating properly and feeding back properly so that everybody wins at the end of the day. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Listen, thank you very much again, Beth. Thank you all for listening and watching. And I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.